another way of talking about this is um are you familiar with the term self and not self no. self means what you are the subject and not self means anything you perceive anything that appears in consciousness which means all objects subtle objects gross objects thoughts feelings experiences dreams states of consciousness cars table chairs houses body the mind all of that um, would be not self in the vedanta way of talking about things the self is that pure consciousness that you are that is aware that it, that is and is aware the sat chit and the not self is everything that arises in it or, or appears in front of it and one way of talking about liberation is when you no longer identify with not self that's liberation and in truth you are always non-identified or unidentified or unattached to not self there's never been a time where in the truth you as beingness are attached to any objective phenomena And all the attachment occurs within this not self. So if there's an if a thought appears, oh gosh, I really, you know, I'm craving such and such. You know, I'm really, you know, I'm really craving listening to some rock and roll music. You know, some audacious, terrible rock and roll, terribly amoral rock and roll music. You know. Then, or whatever you're craving, okay, you're you're craving something. That craving is itself not self. It's just an objective phenomenon that's rising in you. And what you are is that unattached asanga, unattached um, beingness. Remember, asanga means unattached. An asanga is your nature. Now, when the cravings aren't so strong. It's quite simple to sort of stay in that peaceful place of, oh yes, a desire for chocolate cake has arisen and I can just be with that desire for chocolate cake and then it falls away, no problem. When it's a stronger desire, when it's a stronger vasana, when it's a stronger habitual tendency, when it's a stronger vasana, then um, we can't, it's difficult to observe it. We, we find ourselves going into it. And this is where the other yogas come in to help you. But slowly, slowly we relax. Slowly, slowly we become more peaceful and feel happier in ourselves without needing objects to, to gratify and satisfy us. And slowly, slowly, we, we wean ourselves off these things. We don't have to wean ourselves off everything, just enough to come into our beingness. Once we come into our beingness, that takes over. So the long and short of it, Krish, is don't worry, relax. Come back to what you are, that inner peace, that you that is in your nature. And you find your way. You'll find your way. You will. The techniques and the yogas or things you need will come to you. If you need to go on a 12-step program, you'll end up going on a 12-step program. If you need to go to a yoga class, you'll end up doing a yoga class. You need to learn to meditate you'll find yourself buying books or going to a class or watching videos on meditation or something like this you know? if you need to learn to have gratitude in everyday life and surrender to god you will start to do that remember the four yogas we spoke about before yeah, yeah you'll start these four yogas and variations and then will come into your life and their purpose is to bring you back to beingness. The beingness that is everything. 
beingness that is everywhere, everything, all pervading, one with everything, and ever unattached. Always untouched, unscathed, asanga, always asanga. Tom, could I just ask you about the, one of the four yogas? Mm, of course. So I was reading Be As You Are, and I, I feel like I'm drawn to karma yoga. Yes. Um, so spiritualizing your activities. Mm. Um, Ramana Maharshi said that he advised, it, he, he was kind of ambivalent about karma yoga because he said that there's still an I involved yes. and if you can um, if, if you can uh, renounce or sorry if you don't get attached to the fruits of action or if there's no sense of doership then perform karma yoga I guess how do you perform Action without this sense of doership, while you still, while you still feel you are a separate self. Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, obviously, the with the, all the conversations, there's a context, of course. So he's talking to you know Ramana's having a conversation with someone for that person. All the yoga, so any yoga, any practice you do involves an I, an ego, and it will it will perpetuate the ego, but it can also diminish the ego. So if you've got an ego that's this big, doing yoga might make it this big, but it's still perpetuating the ego. But it's thinning the, thinning the ego out. Yeah. Do you see? So it's thinning the ego and perpetuating the ego. All yogas involve an ego, an I, small self, ignorance. All practices doesn't mean practices are useless. We know this because we're drawn to them. We're drawn to practices, whatever it is, whether you're, if you're reading a book, that's a practice, that's a spiritual practice. If you're watching a, a YouTube video, that's a spiritual practice. If you're thinking about it by yourself, you're, oh, I'm trying to figure it out. That's a spiritual practice. This is all illusion. This is all Maya. All spiritual practices are illusion. They're Maya. Therefore, the ego, which doesn't exist. Does that mean we throw them away? No. Is it better to, to renounce the ego? Yes. If you renounce the ego, then no, there's no more possibility of any more practice. That's liberation. If there's no sense of doership, that's liberation. If there's no sense of doership, that means there's no attachment to what's happening. It's just what's happening, happening. That's liberation. So what Raman is saying is be liberated. Realize the self. But of course, that's not that's like the that's that's like the high end or the the, the goal of karma yoga. Karma yoga is really beautiful, really wonderful practice. For many people in this school, it'll be a very important practice. As I've explained it before, the different ways of talking about it, the different levels of it, essentially it's to have gratitude for whatever comes your way. Give thanks to God for whatever comes your way. Doesn't mean you accept it all, but whatever's happening, you, Give thanks for it. You might fight it a bit. You might run away from something. You might run towards something else. But you're giving thanks for it all. Good or bad. Good or bad. And your response. You know, your response might be to, you know, you don't just stand there and take it all necessarily. If a challenge comes your way, you might have to work hard to meet that challenge. Or you might want to run away. From, you might. It might be intelligent to sort of say, okay. Say, some, say a toxic person in your life is coming towards you, you might say, okay, I don't want to be now that person, I'm going to go away. 
So what you're doing, Karma Yuga, say thank you for bringing this toxic person to my life. Thank you for giving me the intelligence and strength and capacity to walk away from this toxic person. You see? You don't change your behavior necessarily, but it's your attitude that's changing. It's the attitude of gratitude. Mm. That's one level of Karma Yuga. Another level of Karma Yuga is to say, God is doing all of this. I'm not doing this. God is bringing a toxic person into my life. God is bringing up this fear and sense that I really despise this toxic person in my life. And God is making me want to walk away from this person. So God is the doer, not me. This conceptual paradigm is utilizing concepts. All the yogas, all practices utilize concepts. There's always a conceptual framework within which they operate either stated conceptual framework or an unstated conceptual framework, conscious conceptual framework or an unconscious conceptual framework. So you say, God, you do it all. Another form of karma yoga, do your best in life. Do everything you need to do in your life, your responsibilities in your life to the best of your ability Try your best, but then whatever result comes, you accept that as a, as a gift from God. So you do your best. It's like you're giving to God. You do your best, and then God gives you the results of your actions. So you might have an important project at work to do. You do your best with the project, and then, but you don't know if you, and then, but maybe the project ends up failing. And that's, the, that's what God's given you as a gift back. You say, okay, God, I try my best. My project has failed. I accept this as a gift from you. I'm going to carry on doing my best. So you cheerfully just carry on doing your best. You do your part, but whatever comes back, you accept as a gift from God. These are different levels of karma yoga. You find, you find what works for you. In the first four or five chapters of the Bhagavad Gita, karma yoga is explained. I think, I think the ultimate power in karma yoga for me is, and I've done a bit, I don't, you've explained it really well, but it's taking the focus away from the me, the me, 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 and channelizing it towards something greater. Yes. And that's, it's, it's, it cuts the ego down to size. Yes. yes. And if you believe, if you do, karma yoga is great because it, you, people who believe in God can do it, and people who don't believe in God can do it. Because you can say it's the universe or whatever. But if you believe in God, and eventually what happens is all your, um, what can happen is that you just see God everywhere. This is like a theistic non duality, just everything is divine. Everything is divine presence, divine being, divine manifestation. And now that not only is the ego being thinned, but the sense of identity on the body mind is being thinned as well. Everything is Christ. Everything is sparkling and illuminated with jesus with christ consciousness everything is glistening with with god's energy you know krishna does all things and is in all things yeah. om namo shivaya yeah. it's all god's will his will be done not my will but his will or thine will be done. So this is going towards bhakti, love and devotion to God and self-surrender. All of it thins out the ego and all of it allows this self-knowledge or realization to arise. They can all go together. Eventually, all, all these yogas involve concepts, don't they? You can see all the concepts there, the ideas. Eventually, all these concepts go. Just beings, just being. And whatever's happening in, in being will happen. Whatever's happening in consciousness will happen. This consciousness, what you are, is everything. This is what you are. You are everywhere. 
everything, all things. Always, already, effortlessly. This is your this is your nature right now. The only thing, there's only one thing that stops you seeing this, as it were, which is the mind, thinking, the thoughts that say, I am the body mind. Ignorance is only in thinking. It's only in the thought. Habitual thought energy that keeps on coming. That, that interprets what, what is, interprets the reality as I am a body mind living in a world. When the thoughts go down, whenever whenever thoughts go down there's an opportunity for an illumination a realization to occur what happens to most of us is when we have if 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 anyone here has had this kind of a non-dual experience or some kind of awakening experience it would have been at a moment where the thoughts are temporarily subsided the problem is the thoughts then come back the ego, the interpretation, I'm a body-mind living in the world, comes back. It's not sustained. So we have a glimpse. For me, it happened when I was reading a book when I was a teenager. I think it happened spontaneously to me many times when I was a younger child. I just didn't think of it as spiritual. Probably happens to many of us like that. But it can any time where the thought, where the mind is not prominent, where it's subsided. If you're, if you're looking at a piece of art, if you're listening to music, if you're in a satsang, if you're listening to a teacher, if you're playing sports, sexual orgasm, if you're hit on the head, Seriously, if you're shocked or frightened, some traumatic event can also make the mind, um, make the thinking process go down and it can give rise to this kind of drugs. Anything that can um, temporarily reduce thinking can shift you out of this paradigm, I am a limited entity. The problem is almost every single one of these things is a limited event so that that temporary thing like reading a book or going to a satsang or listening to some music or looking at a sunset or sexual orgasm or taking drugs or whatever it is it, that that stimulus that created the reduced thought state then goes and then the thoughts come back and now that this ex new experience has been marked on the brain and you recognize, you know, I want that now. So you become, the mind starts seeking that, which generates a whole load of new thoughts. And then this is not experienced again. Until we calm the mind down, come back to beingness. And beingness is not temporary. It's not like reading a book or listening to a teacher or taking drugs or playing sports. Beingness is ever present. So when we come into our beingness and the thoughts subside, this gives us a permanent access to the thought-free state in which ignorance is not constantly reasserting itself. And then as the mind goes down, it experientially it feels like our beingness expands from just being this body mind into everything our consciousness goes from being something limited maybe around our, in our heads or something to everything is in our consciousness it's non-verbal of course it's non it's to totally non-verbal it's not like oh i am everywhere no it's non-verbal it's just like oneness or connect connection 